everybody, this is Miss Peachy from your WCA biology class. I'm going to do another um, video tutorial for your biology B class. Today we are going to talk about speciation. So this is still in unit one on evolution and we are going to be talking about speciation. So what is a species and how do more species develop over time? So the first thing we need to talk about is identifying what a species actually is. And remember that when we look at the classification of living things, that species is going to be the one at the bottom, the most specific of all the different classifications. So you start off with kingdom in this case, plants, phylum, um, flowering plants, these are angiosperms, class, um, dicotyledons, order, um, roses, so they're the rose, rosalia, roses and their allies, um, family rosaceae, and genus rosa species, um, the moss rose, so rosa gallica. That's the most specific identification or most specific classification. So species are the most alike. So every one of these has similarities to each other when we get down to the bottom species are the most unlike of all the different flowers or plants within these groups, right? Um, we can look at different types of roses. Here we have a whole bunch of different types of roses. I have them identified with arrows pointing to the species that they belong to. So they all have similarities. They're all types of roses. They're all found within the, the genus Rosa, but um, they are not the same species. So what makes a species? Um, it's kind of kind of a little bit funky and unclear actually how biologists identify species. Um, so there's multiple different concepts of species. There's the biological species, um, which is pretty much the, de the uh, definition that we're going to use in class, and that is that species indicates a group of of organisms that can physically and do like mate in nature and they can produce offspring but that offspring has to be fertile it has to be able to reproduce as well that constitutes or constitutes a single species but depending on you know which definition you look at um, there's a recognition concept of species where as long as they can recognize each other as potential mates, they are considered the same species. Phylogenic concepts of species. Looking at a, a phylogenic tree or a family tree, the very tip of the tree, anything that falls at that tip would be considered the same species. The reason why I say this is because it isn't exactly um, very clear where the boundaries of species can be. Obviously, it's very, very clear that, for example, a wolf is a different species than your family dog. But, you know, there's a lot of gray area when it comes to identifying and defining what a species is. And sometimes that can be a little bit hard to, um, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's just kind of hard to look at when you don't exactly have a clear defining line. But keep in mind, and I try to say this for anything when it comes to classifying or putting things in groups, those groups are defined by people. People, biologists, they love to put things in groups. So we put things into groups, but a lot of times in the natural world, things don't fit perfectly into a group. So there's always going to be a little gray on the overlap between two different groups. So... Remember we talked about gene flow. So gene flow is where different individuals move in and out of a population which introduces different genes, different alleles into that population and it keeps things very diverse. If you stop gene flow, then you're essentially isolating that population. And when you isolate a population and you don't introduce new alleles from a different population, then the population that's isolated, they become more alike. 
each other. And then the other population that's now isolated also, they become more alike each other. And then as they're becoming more alike their own population, they're becoming a lot more different than the other population. You can see our little cartoon with the koala here. What do you mean she moved away? Helping gene flow, my butt. So apparently his girlfriend decided to move away saying, hey, I'm helping gene flow. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making sure that the population of koalas is very diverse. But what happens when gene flow is interrupted? In this picture here, you can see that this is one classic example of isolating a population. I'm just going to move the picture off the words here for a minute. But we see that we have um, two populations of birds, and we just colored them blue and red so that we can more easily see the difference here. But if they're the same type of bird, and they become physically isolated, geographically isolated by this mountain chain in the middle, right? Then the birds no longer intermingle with each other. They're separated, in this case, by a physical barrier, meaning that this population over here only mates with each other. And this population over here only mates with themselves. They no longer have individuals from the other population coming into their midst. So the genes over here in population B are contained in population B. And the genes over here in population A are contained in population A. Over time, population A, they become very similar to each other. They all share the same common genes because they're all intermingling and mating with them each other. Same thing happens with population B. Over time, population A and population B become less alike. Okay? They're more, the population themselves is more alike, but they become less like the other population. Okay, we can see that example right here. We have our parent species, which in this case would have been that species of birds that they both derived from. And we have two distinct populations that diverge and are separated. Okay, they start off being somewhat different from each other, and as time goes on, they just become more and more different from each other. They become to a point where they become so different from each other that even if you were to try to put them back together in physical space, they would no longer breed with each other because they would have different um, maybe mating rituals, they would have different preferences, which would exclude them from mating with the other population. When this happens, we call this speciation. This is a process of a separate species being created. It's not like something magical or crazy happens. Nothing's morphing or changing into something radically different. It just is because of separation, in this case geographical separation, that really makes each population distinctly different from each other. Here we have um, another example. And this is a slightly, it's similar, but it's slightly different in the mechanism of how it's separated. So here we have a population of frogs. And in this, um, this prairie area where all these frogs live, they they're often, you know, they, they live throughout this entire area, right? And if you notice, there's areas where the grass is a little lighter, and there's areas where the foliage is a little bit darker. And the frogs themselves can vary in, in coloration. Um, what happens is a road is built right in the middle, separating the two populations. Just so happens to separate them in such a way that we have a, a lighter colored uh, part of the prairie over here and a darker colored part of the prairie over here, right? Over time, it's more advantageous for the lighter um, allele to populate in the lighter colored prairie. They're more camouflaged this way, and so that is an evolutionary advantage. 
um, the selection pressure here is the, the change in environment, right? It's causing the lighter colored frog to be a better version, have more of a, a be fitter for that particular area of the prairie. So over time, what we see is we see a change in allele frequency. Oh my gosh, I'm bringing that back again, right? That whole a change in allele frequency. I'm going to try to give this a go here. I have my little... Oh, here we go. Try this one more time. Here we go. Here. I'm going to try this here. So change... Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I did it again. Guys, the zooming in and out thing. Yeah, okay. I hit the wrong button. Okay, so change. Really slanted. In allele frequency. I think I lost my picture somewhere in here, too. Okay. So we get this change in allele frequency. And we've talked about the change in allele frequency before, right? The change in allele frequency occurs when you have a population that may have a small percentage of light-colored frogs, but because of some change in the, in the environment, all of a sudden now you have a larger percentage of light-colored frogs. So you're getting a change, an evolution, that's occurring because of the environmental change. Now, the big thing here is that one, at what point do you get a change in allele frequency that results in speciation? So right away, just because you get more light-colored frogs in one area and more dark-colored frogs doesn't mean you have a new species of frogs. It takes time. It takes that separation occurring over a long period of time where you have small changes that continue to get larger and larger and larger until you get to a point where you have those two separated groups of frogs that no longer would mate with one another if given the opportunity. Even if you were to put them back in physical space, they would choose not to. Okay, In that case, you can see the development of a new species. So at some point, this process of change in allele frequency can result in a new species. But that's where the gray area kind of comes into play, remember, because what defines a species sometimes can be just the fact that they are separated. Maybe if you put them back into place together, they would eventually start hybridizing and, you know, kind of becoming the same species again. That can happen. Okay, so sometimes just that physical separation is enough to define them as two different species because they can't reproduce, they can't mate together because they're not together. But it doesn't mean that if they didn't reintroduce them that they wouldn't. Okay, so I know it becomes a little bit tricky. If given enough time you reintroduce them, they're going to be different enough and they won't. But if not enough time has passed, it, there is a potential that when you reintroduce them they will hybridize and they will kind of morph back into a single species. And that does, and that can happen, and it does happen. So there are other types of geographical isolation. Here we talked about an instance where a population was completely um, cut in half, essentially. In this situation, um, we can see that, that that's kind of like the first one. Allopatric speciation is where you cut the population in half. That's what's happening with these two groups of trees here. In sympatric speciation, um, there's something else. For example, in this case, perhaps there is slight differences in the environment in the inside of the forest versus the outside of the forest. So even though um, there, there's no geographical barrier, maybe the soil pH is different on the inside of the forest, maybe there's not enough sunlight on the inside of the forest, there's something inside the forest that is keeping these trees from kind of occupying that niche. So we see a different group of trees only occupy the niche on the inside of the forest here. So again, they're still together in physical space, but there is some barrier 
whether it's the soil, the temperature, the sunlight, some other physical barrier that's keeping them from being together. I'm going to real life examples of this. Here we see a ground squirrel. Um, we have the Harris antelope squirrel and the white tailed antelope squirrel. They have descended from a common ancestral population and they were separated during the formation of the Grand Canyon. So they live on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. They have a physical, geographical, isolating separation. There are other types of ways in which organisms are separated that are not physical. They're not like physically separated by some barrier. Um, so for example, ecological isolation. They might live in the same habitat, but for some reason they don't actually come in contact with each other. For example, a beetle that lives on a tree versus the beetle that lives in the grass. They're actually together in physical space, kind of, right? They could potentially come across each other and mate, but they don't because they live in different parts of that particular habitat. Temporal isolation is a very, very important one. Um, if you have a nocturnal animal and one that's diurnal that, lives, that comes out during the daytime, they might live in the same physical space and occupy the same niches, but they don't actually come in contact with each other because while one's awake, the other one is sleeping. So they're not going to have any kind of contact with each other and then um, therefore no opportunity to mate. And when you're mating, you know, you are merging your DNA and that's how um, species actually become hybridized and, and kind of morph into a single species. Behavioral isolation, this is super important. And this is what oftentimes geographic isolation leads to. Over time, different behaviors will isolate them. Um, some birds have specific songs they sing to get a mate. Some birds have specific mating dances that they do. Um, perhaps it's got to do more so with coloration or with, you know, migration or nesting or some other kind of characteristic that is a behavioral character characteristic that would um, exclude mates that didn't share that behavior. If you're not mating with each other, you're not able to be sharing DNA, right? And therefore you're of separate species. Um, mechanical isolation. You have to have the right body parts. <laughs> To be able to physically come in contact with each other. This is a classic example of a snail, I think it is, that actually it's almost exactly the same. Hang on, let me just grab the example real quick because I don't think I have it in here. Okay, so here's the example I was talking about with the snail. This is um, a Bradybenia snail, two different species, but because their spirals go opposite directions, the parts that actually mate with each other are on the wrong side. So even if they were to want to mate with each other, they physically can't do it. They don't fit together. In this case, it's nothing like, you know, it's nothing that's really outrageous as far as differences go. These two snails are very much alike, but they have a barrier because they don't actually have the physical body parts matching up with one another that allow mating to occur. It's called mechanical isolation, sometimes called a prezygotic barrier because it happens prior to fertilization, right? Prior to fertilization. And then you have um, gametic isolation. Even if mating can occur, if the egg and sperm can't fuse properly, or even if that can happen, if a gamete can form, but there's like the DNA is incompatible with each other and then the whole thing becomes kind of a mutant that just miscarries, that's a barrier in um, reproduction. So again, if you can't mate physically with one another or you can't physically produce an offspring that's fertile, you can't be of the same species. That is an absolute characteristic. Okay. Um, there is hybridization that can occur. Now, hybridization is kind of funky because there are hybrids that can form that are infertile, and then there are hybrids that can form that are fertile. And that's where I say that speciation or that species definition can sometimes be a little bit gray. Um, for example, a horse and a 
donkey can mate and produce an infertile offspring, right? And depending on whether the horse is the male or the horse is the female, there's two different terms that's used. It's a mule or, and I can't remember what the second term is used um, for the other option. But it, they do produce an offspring. It's just that the offspring is not fertile, right? Now, in case some other cases, um, sometimes you can have two different species that can mate and produce a fertile offspring, a fertile hybrid, and that does occur. Um, and that's where people oftentimes will say, you know, are they really a separate species, right? But by the biological definition of species, they can and do in nature mate and produce fertile offspring, and that's like their, their preference. Now, if they're forced into like close proximity with each other, and in that situation they're mating and producing fertile offspring, it's not really a natural situation. So even if they can do it in that particular situation, doesn't mean that they would in nature, right? And that therefore they're still considered to be separate species. Um, it also does happen, like I said, if you have a physical barrier separating two different groups that are considered to be separate species, and that physical barrier is removed, those two separate species can merge back together, hybridize, and form a single species. And that can happen. And in that case, the two separation are, are when they were separated is probably not as much time has passed so they didn't become so different from each other that they were unable to produce that fertile offspring um so over time speciation occurs at different rates speciation is oftentimes you know it's going to have to do a lot with um, outside influences whether there's separation you know whether organisms become separated um, different changes in the environment and stuff like that and and whether or not certain characteristics um, actually become more advantageous right if you have specific characteristics that really change the survivability of a, of a different species then you can see rapid changing rapid evolution occurring if the organism is really pretty adapted very well to the environment over time it's not going to change that much because it's not going to have any specific characteristics that are going to increase its fitness. So we can see you know, either lots and lots of evolution or very, very little. Um, the horseshoe crab, for example, is a 300 million year old species to some degree and it's only had 13 different like renditions of it. Um, and that's occurred over 300 million years, whereas the Galapagos finches have diversified into 13 species over just the last 100,000 years. Okay, now there are two different ways to look at how speciation occurs. There is either gradualism or punctuated equilibrium. And both are actually correct. Um, either we have a very gradual change in how a species is over time, and we saw that with when we separated the birds, remember, and we saw that they were slightly different at first, and as each population only bred with itself, that over time they become more and more different. That would be an example of gradualism. Punctuated equilibrium is more along the lines of some major event that occurred that actually changed what was the most fit in that population say a huge change in climate occurring um, or perhaps a big event like a, I don't know, like a landslide or something that wiped out a big chunk of the population. So there's some external factor that rapidly changed what it meant to be successful in that group. And then you'll see a big change occur in a pretty short period of time. And both of these things actually are seen in the fossil record, both gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. All right. So finally, so here's some example, by the way, of when we might see some punctuated equilibrium. We have these big mass extinctions that have occurred over the last 600 million years, um, five major mass extinctions. And after those big mass extinctions, we would see a rapid change in um, evolution because you know, lots of stuff went extinct, a lot of competition was gone, 
And if there's competition that's gone, suddenly it makes, kind of paves the way for the success of a different group of organisms. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sorry that was a little bit longer today. Um, hopefully that helped a little bit understanding what a species is, although like I said, that's a bit on the gray side sometimes, but also what things can lead to changes that will eventually result in speciation. It's primarily um, isolation, physical isolation or geographical isolation that occurs that isolates two populations. Um, there can also be other types of isolation such as behavioral isolation, temporal isolation, um, and then of course just not being able to mate with each other because you don't have the right parts, or if mating occurs that, that the actual embryo can't develop because they're not physically compatible with each other. So those are some of the things that contribute to the development of new species and that's a really big um, point, a really big kind of thing that evolution by natural selection has revealed. Thank you very much everybody and have a great day.